our meeting tonight. Um, we are a family family network. We are a project under the Utah Parent Center. The family to family network is a statewide parent support network run by volunteers. We are all moms of kiddos with special uh, special needs. Um, we educate, strengthen, and support families of persons with disabilities, especially those on the wait list or are in services with DSPD, the Division of Services for People with Disabilities. Network leaders, we are all parents of individuals with special needs, and we link families with local resources, services, we do event trainings and workshops, and we like to play a little bit and get our families out as well once in a while. So I will go ahead and turn over. We're lucky to have Lisa Wade and Corinne Frazier from the Utah Parent Center to present all the information we need to know about DSPD today. So we'll just turn the time over to them. And please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll try to address those as we go along. I'm letting one more person in, but tonight, as Tracy said, we're gonna talk about next level DSPD. We've talked about the wait list, um, I think last month in the Utah County Network. So tonight we're gonna talk about what does it mean when you get in services and um, getting to the heart of the matter. So to get started, we'll introduce ourselves. Hi, I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight and just want to thank the Family to Family Network for allowing me to come. They are a great resource professionally and for my little family and just thank you for all the work that they do. It's an amazing organization. I'm Corinne Frazier. I own my own support coordinator company called Synergy Case Management, and I love being a support coordinator. It is my dream job, and I'm also the proud mom of two special needs boys that have IEPs and 504s. Aren't they adorable? Thanks. <laughs> And my name is Lisa Wade, and I too am a parent of a young man with autism and other disabilities. You can see him in our big family photo. We're all hunched together, and he's stick straight in the yellow shirt behind me. Um, and he brought me into the disability world, and I've been advocating and, and enjoying um, being with other families as we go on this journey together for many, many years. And I work at the Utah Parent Center as the Family to Family Network co-coordinator. And I too am very happy to be here. So let's go over what is DSPD. And if, if you were in the um, last month's call or workshop, you talked about what DSPD is, what it can offer, how to get on the wait list, all those kinds of things. But DSPD or the Division of Services for People with Disabilities manages the home and community-based waiver services for the state of Utah. And they support individuals with disabilities, more than 6,000 of them in our state to live independent and self-determined lives as possible um, by supporting them into their homes and in their communities, in jobs, in a variety of ways. Tonight, we're going to go through the process of what happens when you actually get into DSPD services, that magical moment, right? Um, we're going to give you some general ideas of the process, as the specifics are going to vary greatly depending on the needs of the individual, what their support needs are, what their interests are, what their dreams are. But this will give you kind of a general overview of what you can expect when you come into DSPD services. What is, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. What is a support? I, are my, my slides are wrong. It should be in services. Now what? There. Yes. We're going to go backwards. Okay. We're, okay, great. So yeah. 
Once you are on the waiting list for DSPD services, you will be assigned a waitlist worker. It's really important to stay in touch with this waitlist worker and to follow up with any correspondence that you receive from DSPD. Your waitlist worker will reach out to you by phone call, by email, or a letter in the mail, snow mail, and they will give you the magical and wonderful news that you have been funded to come off the wait list. Your next step is to throw a little dance party because <laughs> it's a huge, huge accomplishment. What will happen next is that your waitlist worker will set up interviews for your family, for your consumer, for your loved one to be able to interview and to choose a support coordinator. An ISO is sent out to all support coordinators in the state of Utah and we can cover many different areas. We will get an email saying that someone has been funded for the waiting list and would like to interview with us. The waitlist worker then works with the family and their schedule to set up a couple of interviews for a support coordinator. This usually takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And I like to suggest to families to make sure that they interview at least three or four to kind of get a feel of who they feel would fit best with their family. So let's talk a little bit more about that support coordinator. What is a support coordinator? Corinne? Yes. That's your job. So tell us about it. It's so awesome. I love my job. So a support coordinator privately contracts with the Division of Services for People with Disabilities. We have a Medicaid contract to provide support coordination services. Your support coordinator is going to be your biggest piece to your DSPD puzzle, and they are going to be the ones to help support you, to help choose your services, to help inter help you interview with providers. They are the glue that kind of holds everything together. Part of our services to families are making sure that you stay in your contracted budget for your plan to make sure that services are meeting your loved one's needs, to make sure that all providers are providing the documentation needed, which is a Medicaid regulation and guideline, and to meet regularly with you and your family or your loved one in their services to just check in and make sure that everything is going really well for you. And then another neat aspect of a support coordinator's role is to help you connect with other resources that you might need in the community. And also a big one is to make sure that your Medicaid is going well and that you are following up with the Medicaid renewal, which happens once a year, and to make sure that all of your medical services are being met through your Medicaid waiver. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, you have the right to choose your support coordinator. So I'm going to talk about, from the family's perspective, how you go about this process. Um, as Corinne mentioned, you can work with your waitlist worker and do an invitation for service offer, ISO. Of course, there's acronyms for everything. Um, and they then support coordinators can respond and you can go through that route and um, interview them and find out if they're a good fit for you. You can also um, go on your own and, and maybe there's someone that you know that is a support coordinator or your friend has a support coordinator that they really like. Um, I often see posted on social media this question about who's your support coordinator? Does anybody have a one that they really love? 
And um, I will rarely tell anyone who my support coordinator is because I want to protect her and, and make sure that she's not overworked because I want her spending so much time helping my son. But Mike's support coordinator is an absolute rock star as you will come to find out because she's presenting with us tonight. Um, DSPD has a list of support coordinators that you can get on their website and, and go through. It doesn't say, however, like where they're located or if they have any specialties or maybe speak a language or anything like that. You have to do some digging, but you can go in and narrow down the list. Maybe if you want somebody who has their own company or you're looking for someone um, who works for a larger company, so maybe there's more backup or things. I mean, whatever's important to you is what you should kind of narrow your list down as you're searching for your support coordinator. Now, if you're like me, interviewing is not something I do on a regular basis, so I get a little nervous thinking about what, what do I ask when I interview someone. So here are some suggestions of questions that you could ask when you're interviewing your support coordinator. And there may be questions that are really important to you, like how do you prefer to communicate? You know, maybe I don't use email. I want someone who's going to text me things all the time. Or um, are you available at night? That might be really something that's important to you. Or how well do you know my child's disability or their medical need? So whatever things are important to you, make sure that you find that right fit by asking those questions of your support coordinator. Now, Corinne, tell us about it from your perspective. Yeah, so a support coordinator will have the opportunity to receive the ISO. The ISO simply has some background information like John Smith was funded. We're looking to help the family with respite or the family's interested in a day program. So we kind of get a feel for what is most important for the family when we go to interview. You'll definitely want to find someone that you feel will best fit with your family and is willing to advocate for all of your needs. And I personally have been with most of my families for 15 plus years. So you really build a strong foundation, a strong relationship, and you really look to your support coordinator to be able to advocate for any changes that might happen within your family. You can always ask a support coordinator, do you have a resume? What's your educational background? What kind of interests do you have as far as advocacy roles with the disability services in Utah? Simply, I found out during an interview process that a family was dealing with infantile grand mal seizures, and that, that is the same diagnosis that my six-year-old has. And they felt like I had experience with school services, with pediatric neurology, that they felt with my information and my background that I would be the best advocate, advocate for their little girl. I have a really dear friend who is also a support coordinator, and she has a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. And through the interviewing process, she found out that one of the families, that their little guy had the same medical diagnosis, and they felt like she would be the best match to help with their services. So I feel like families can really be selective and really have the opportunity to pick someone that you feel will best meet your needs. It's really important for bigger companies and bigger organizations that you might interview with. You'll want to ask if the owner of the company is there, but also the support coordinator who will be assigned to your consumer 
to your client or to your loved one, because you really want to know who you're going to be working with. And then also, it's important to know that all of the support coordinators have access to the same resources and the same funding. So please be aware that support coordinator companies can't say, hey, if you come with me, I'll get you more money or I'll get you equipment. It's not like that. So you just want to be careful if you hear anything related to that. And, and then, oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead, Corinne. Then I was just going to say, it's just important to know that all of the support coordinators have come into this field because we like helping people. And I would say, I am really amazed by the support coordinators that have chosen to go into this field. And I pretty much can say that everyone really has a heart of gold and really want to work and help families. Absolutely. And Corinne, we did have a question in the chat. Do yeah. support coordinators ever decline clients? Yes. So everything is based on Medicaid waiver services and part of your Medicaid waiver for your family is choice of services. And I feel like choice of services is a really important concept that your client, your family, your loved one that you're advocating for is able to choose who they feel is best able to help meet their needs. If a support coordinator feels like it might not be a good match, then they do have 30 days notice that they have to be able to give the family to let them know they're discontinuing services. And that Part of the information we'll go over in the slides is when you meet with your support coordinator, all companies are required to have a grievance process. And this is the opportunity where you can meet with your support coordinator with the owner of the company and ask them why they might be declining your client to kind of help you figure out the path or the supports you need to help find a support coordinator that would best suit your individual and family's needs. And then a follow-up question, what if you're denied Medicaid? Oh, so that is a great question. So part of the reason why DSPD services has such a long waiting list is because once you get on the community support waiver or the brain injury waiver, you get Medicaid services without having to qualify for any other waiver programs because your diagnosis helps you get the Medicaid. That being said, if you are denied Medicaid, then I would reach out to the Medicaid worker because support coordinators are only funded through Medicaid. So if you're denied Medicaid, you can't get support coordinator services. I hope that makes sense. And so I would definitely work with like the Utah Parent Center Family to Family Network and see if they can direct you to someone who might help you figure out why the Medicaid was denied. If the Medicaid was denied because you didn't fill out a renewal, because you have to do that every year, then you really need to get with your support coordinator and meet with DSPD to make sure that that can get reinstated. Sorry, that's a double-edged question because it could go both ways. So hopefully I answered it. If not, let me know. It made sense to me. And I know okay. as one who has not turned in their paperwork in time and had my son's Medicaid canceled, <clears throat> that that can happen. But thankfully, people are very forgiving and um, will let, let you submit them a little bit late. 
Um, Tracy asked if there's a degree required to be a support coordinator and yes. do you have to have a support coordinator or can you just do it on your own? Oh, that's a great question. So yes, there is a requirement for support coordinators to have a bachelor's degree. Mine is in psychology, so they will allow human development, family development, psychology, and social work. So you do have to have a bachelor's degree. And then can you be your own support coordinator? That is a great question, and I will have to get back to you on that. And I think that um, doing self-administered services, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is a lot like, is a lot of work, almost like your support coordinator, but you're not. You have a support coordinator to help you. So thank you. And um, let's see. Let's talk about, oh, this is really important. You can always change your support coordinator at any time. Yes, they're the glue that holds everything together. So if you are not happy with how things are going or you're not gelling as a team or um, you don't feel like they're meeting your needs, you are welcome to change. And yes, there is a staffing crisis, so it is harder to find providers, but I think there are still plenty of support coordinators available if I'm not mistaken. So remember that. And don't feel like you're pressured or anything to choose one support coordinator over another. You, you need to do what, um, what works for your family. And Wilson is asking a question about money. Hey, Jody, maybe you could answer that to Wilson in the chat. Okay. Um, so next step, Karen, what happens yes. next? So the next step, once you select your support coordinator, they will help you work through a mountain of paperwork. But don't worry, your support coordinator is there to hold your hand. So once you select your support coordinator, by regulation, they are to meet with you within 30 days of when you have selected them. The first item on the agenda is to help you understand and review your DSPD budget to understand what the waitlist worker has created for you and your family and what services are in place. They also will conduct what is called the Utah Comprehensive Assessment of Needs. And this is really a great tool and I'm so glad that DSPD, the Division of Services for People with Disabilities, has decided to have this utilized. It is very strength-based and it's neat to see in a meeting families and the consumers and the clients be so excited to share with you what their strengths are and then we use those strengths to help determine the goals for the person-centered service plan. Some of the forms that you will need to fill out with your support coordinator is a Medicaid release form. Once you are receiving DSPD services, you are able to get Medicaid and Medicaid requires that there's an annual review or sometimes if your consumer or loved one is working and there might be a change in income status, there's like a review process for that and your support coordinator can help you with that. They also wanna make sure that your Medicaid is current and up to date for medical appointments, for all of the services that are in your PCSP plan because that is how the services get paid. They will also work with you on your social history with your family. And this includes information about hospitalizations, medications, doctors, treatments, behavior supports, coping skills. All of that background information is needed to help create a really strong person-centered service plan. 
And part of the tools that you can use for a person-centered service plan is charting the life course and family planning tools that will be added in the chat that you guys can access. And these are so helpful because they guide and direct you to what your family or loved one's strengths are and to help present a bigger picture of what goals need to be supported in helping with the PCSP plan. Okay, there are two different service models that are available. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I switched slides, sorry about that. Oh, you're mm -hmm. fine. One is a provider-based service, and this is where your support coordinator will work with you and your family in interviewing providers that have contracts with DSPD. And providers are someone who could deliver after school programs or someone who has a contract for day program services or someone who has a contract for supported employment. All of the paperwork and all of the Medicaid requirements are funneled through the provider. There's nothing that the family has to take care of on their own. And then there is SAS services, which stands for self-administered services. This is where families get to hire and train and be able to choose their own staff to come in and work with their clients and their consumers. Part of taking on this SaaS provider model is that you are in charge of all of your paperwork. But rest assured, your support coordinator is there to help you with all of that paperwork. And then you'll use a fiscal agent to help with the payroll for oh. your staff. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys can see my screen. I'm so sorry. I forgot I was sharing. Thank oh. you for the low reminder, Bridget. <laughs> Yay. I, I was sorry. I went, I was trying to find some, um, Links. Links. For the chat. So my apologies. Self-administered services. Oh, yes. So you have to use a fiscal um, management service that pays for the payroll, that does the taxes. So that's under self-administered services. With that being said, you can use a combo. So you could have your loved one go to an after school program or a day program, and then use SAS for respite. So there's just two different models, but you can use a combination of both. I will say with the self-administered services, I've just noticed with my families that I help support if you're not very organized, which some of us have strengths in that area and some need support, I would say provider-based services might be the best if you're not very organized because there's a mountain of paperwork. <laughs> yeah, and speaking as one who did self-administered services for many years, it, it's a part-time job, so. Okay, the person-centered support plan and the meeting. Ah, this is my favorite part of the job. So this is where we get to celebrate those goals that your loved one, your client, the consumer has been working on. And it's just so much fun. I love them. So your support coordinator is in charge of reaching out probably, I like to do it four to six weeks before the budget is renewed. Oh, I should explain that. So your budget goes for a 12 month period. And usually the PCSP plan is done one month prior to when your budget ends. 
So the support coordinator will reach out to everyone that's on your team and they'll schedule the team meeting. And it's really important to have everyone just know that this is a strength-based meeting and it should be a celebration of everything that has been accomplished within the year. I like to reach out to my families and to have them think of goals and maybe even review the last year's planning meeting goals and say, hey, how do you think we did? What are some goals that you would like to work on for this upcoming year? And to really motivate your loved one or your consumer or client, I feel like if they have a say in their goals, it just gives them so much purpose and so much motivation to be excited about accomplishing that goal. So that's a really big part of what I try to encourage. Please know that your PCSP plans and goals and supports can be revised at any time. It is not set in stone. And it's really important if changes are happening in the family, like illness or loss of a job or any, any big change that you please let your support coordinator know so that they can help you with revision of those goals and help think of different ways that they're able to support you. The you can assessment, which is strength-based, gives us little tidbits of information of where we can really have the client shine with their strengths to help build those supports and help solidify their goals. And so the you can assessment is reviewed to help make sure that the goals line up with their strengths. Oh, examples of PCSP goals. So one of my clients was really excited about exercising. So she drew a picture of herself on her bike with 30 minutes underneath the bike. And she hung it up on her fridge to remind her that she wanted to work on this exercise goal. And it was something that she set herself. So it was really neat that she was able to bring that to the PCSP meeting, the person-centered support planning meeting, and have everyone celebrate with her on this goal. I had another client who loves to do crafts and arts, and she went through lots of different magazine pictures, and she came up with a vision board of going to Disneyland, of being able to take walks, to go to movies, and we were able to use this to help create a framework for her goals. I have another client who works with his mom and they are awesome at charting the life course and they come up with themes and ideas and they come together prepared for the meeting to talk about to talk about his celebrations and talk about where they want the future to go. I have another client that loves to write and she has a journal and she would write down her goals and ideas and bring them to the meeting to have talking points and to kind of give us direction of where she wanted to go. I had another client who simply had a goal of being calm when he was upset. So during the meeting, he was able to write down all of the things that helps him feel calm and helps him with his coping strategies. And then he had a fun time decorating his room using those word strips to help him remember part of his goals. So it's great to have them be a part of developing their goals. Thanks, Corinne. And from a family's perspective, I remember um, not really being sure what 
to expect in a person-centered support planning meeting. And so it was really nice to have a support coordinator to help walk us through that process. I've been in a, a lot of IEP meetings, so I was familiar with that process, but uh, PCSPs are similar, but a little bit different in um, how they're formatted. So just the big thing for me that I learned is to let my son use his voice as much as possible. And obviously when he was younger, um, I pulled the mom knows best card a lot and uh, kind of guided the direction of his goals. But as he got older, I've had to learn to step back and let him choose his goal, goals. And as like, as Corinne said, you know, there's more buy-in from the individual and in working on their goals when they've had some say in what the goal is going to be. Um, and I'm a big believer in being a team player and a collaborator and being part of the solution. And so I love having, um, we call it Team Brandon, and we have meetings to plan what everyone on Team Brandon is going to do to help support him in the next year. Um, and having that kind of an attitude really helps people get behind the most important reason, right? The person, um, my son, and what's going to be best for him. So don't be nervous about your PCSP meeting. Um, they are powerful in that it guides the budget for the year and guides what mm -hmm. your loved one's going to be working on. But like Corinne says, it can be changed if things aren't working out or if you see something that um, is a more imminent need, you know, you can switch goals um, make, and make some changes that way. But part of um, the PCSP, person-centered planning tools that help support it. And um, these include the tools from charting the life course, which their tools are available free at lifecoursetools.com. Um, and DSPD has encouraged the use of some of their tools, including their life trajectory, the integrated support star, the um, life domain vision tool, and long-term services and supports template. And if you're interested in learning more, um, they also do the relationship map, which helps you know uh, kind of who are the people in your loved one's life and maybe see if there's gaps or needs for support and then good day, bad day. Um, DSPD has a repository of person-centered planning information and tools on their website. And I put the link on the slide. And then um, Parent Center also has a great repository of person center planning information, including our own Tracy Brown, who's the Utah County Network co-leader, and her daughter doing some tools. I think it was the support star, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, there's a little video clip of, of them uh, talking about how they used one of the Charting the Life course tools in person. Tracy, you remember that? <laughs> we did do the star. Yep. And it's so good. It's one of those things that you know, she's been ours. She's 22. We've, I've been her mom for all this time, but it helps you take a different perspective. Think of things that you didn't think of. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Good tools. Thanks. Thanks for that um, unsolicited plug. I appreciate <laughs> that. On, um, on February 17th, the Salt Lake County Family to Family Network was going to be hosting their uh, meeting on person-centered support plans. And I will be presenting there and talking specifically about a couple of the life course tools, explaining them. And um, for those of you on the wait list, you've probably heard about the tools for planning support webinar series that DSPD is hosting. Hopefully you've been getting emails about that. And um, that series, started in January. We have a meeting on February 8th. And um, I've got the flyer. And when this is when I'm not sharing my screen anymore and can bounce around a bit, um, I will put the uh, upload the file to the PDF for that flyer. 
Um, but we will be talking about the life trajectory and uh, the life domain vision tool, I think, are the two tools that we will be discussing on the 8th. And you are all welcome to come to that. If you can't make those upcoming events, um, they will be recorded. DSPDs is going to will be housed on their person center planning website, and the Salt Lake Family to Family Networks will be eventually on the YouTube um, on YouTube under the Utah Parent Center page, and um, so you can watch it there at your own convenience. The nice thing too, sometimes about watching a recording, is that you can stop and start and kind of digest the information as you go. So if that's helpful at all. Corinne, so, tell us about goals. Yes, thanks. So the reason why we have a person-centered service plan and goals is because DSPD services are funded through the home and community-based waiver services. Part of the Medicaid guidelines and regulations require us to make sure that we are reporting back on the goals for data collection. They also use it for funding resources and just documentation of what is in the Medicaid contract for our DSPD services are being met through the person-centered service plan. So I would like to talk about a person-centered service plan goal might be Sally wants to exercise, she'll ride her bike for 30 minutes. Part of that support strategy is listed in the person-centered service plan as instructions of how we're gonna help Sally make sure that she's riding her bike 30 minutes. And these are specific instructions that can be written with the team to make sure that they are being followed to help support your loved one. Then part of a support coordinator's job and role is to be able to check in monthly with the providers. And then also, if you're using your self-administered services, we would also check in and make sure that progress was happening on this goal. If anything needs to be changed with the support strategies, or if there was no progress, what is a barrier to that goal for not being met. And some of that might include like a recent hospitalization, a behavior issue. And it's always really, really important that you give that information to your support coordinator because they can make sure that documentation is in place in case there needs to be a change in the PCSP plan that's related to those services that you have on the plan. Let's see, any questions? Should I ask questions? Any questions related <laughs> to the PCSP? I haven't seen anything in the chat okay. and sometimes people might not understand like for me, it's, I don't even know enough to ask a question. Right. Oh, and it's always important to know, and I know I said this prior as well, that your PCSP goals are flexible. You can always ask for a person-centered service plan meeting to be held if you want the whole team together to talk about services. And then your UCANs will be reviewed every six months to be part of those piece, part of your person-centered service plan. I'm so used to acronyms. Yes. Just roll off our tongue, don't they? So Corinne, tell us about some of the possible services that may arise or that you might access as part of, or as the result of your planning meeting and your goals. Yes. So respite services are available both through the provider and through SAS. 
your self-administered services. A lot of families are familiar like with Camp K. They have great summer programs that DSPD has a contract with. They also have community programs like going to a jazz game, going to the ballet. They also do a great Saturday camp where they pick the clients up and it usually goes nine to three. And they have themes like a Disney theme that they are able to do Disney crafts and they're great at holiday crafts. Also for respite, there are some awesome summer programs that do outdoor abilities like river rafting, skiing, horseback riding. And those are through like the National Ability Center and adaptive sports and explore. So it's good to talk to your support coordinator if you feel like that might be a great benefit for your consumer or your loved one in services. We also have day program services for kiddos that are still in school. And so a lot of times we might have like a working mom or working dad or a caregiver that is working full time and school gets out at three and they might not get home till six. And that can kind of help with gap services to allow them to go to an after school program from three to six. During the summertime when kids, I keep saying kids because I have kids, but young adults <laughs> might not be in school. There are awesome summer programs that will take the clients out into the community to do community-based activities. There's also massage therapy behavioral supports, working with someone who has a behavioral background to come in and help you give supports related to behavior issues and needs. Transportation services are provided by UTA or providers who have vans to come and pick up your loved one for the after school program or the summer program. There's also residential services for group homes. And this is the only service that's not available through SAS and also host home services where your client and loved one would actually live in a group home. There's employment services to help them get ready to work out in the community. There's supported living where providers have staff or SAS can hire their own staff, staff to come in and help with laundry, organizing, getting to activities, going to medical appointments. A lot of times we have clients that fall and need help getting up and we have emergency response systems and medication reminders to help them we also have a housekeeping and chore services to help the client have a clean and organized house and to be able to provide services to teach them also on how to do their chores. That's when I was thinking, my son really needs that. It's not him. It's me that wants the housekeeping and chore services. But um like Corinne said, these are possible services based on the need um, and they may or may not apply, but that, and there are others that are not on this list. It's not all inclusive, but um, just know that those are some possibilities depending on the need of your loved one. So employment should be a lifelong goal. And I know there are some of you with younger kids who are rolling your eyes and saying, it will never happen, but your kids grow up. And even though I always hoped that my son would be able to work, I never, I prepared for the worst case scenario that he wouldn't, but I always hoped that he could. And Utah is an employment first state. So as a state, the agencies that use state dollars are going to encourage and support employment um, as the preferred option. So starting at age 14, 
um, your support coordinator will want to discuss employment options with you in your person-centered planning meeting. And they may go over something called an employment pathway tool that DSPD has uh, put together that talks about different pathways and some next actions and some things that you could do um, to help prepare for employment or if you're already employed, maybe you want more hours or you want a different position or it just looks at all of the different options. Employment is not a must do, but it's definitely encouraged. And um, I told Corinne, I wanted to talk about this topic because um, I'm passionate about it now. My son, it, it took us a couple of years of heavy duty work um, using his supported living staff to work on job skills and independent um, skills, but to get him where he could hold down a job. And he worked for almost three years before the pandemic hit at a movie theater that he loved that job, loved it, loved it. And it was just a few hours a week, but he got so much satisfaction out of that of going wearing his uniform and keeping his uniform clean and doing his little tasks and getting to go to the movies on a regular basis um, as a perk of the job and um, pandemic hit and he was no longer able to work or volunteer he had a couple of volunteer things that he liked to do and so I was really glad a few months ago that he was able to find another job. And again, it's just a few hours a week, but it really makes a difference in how he feels about himself. And you should know my son is not really verbal and he needs to have 24 seven supervision. Um, so you wouldn't go, oh, of course he has a job. He's a perfect candidate. No, he has many, many, many barriers to employment, but um, dream big, don't give up. You never know what could happen and, and finding the right supports and the right situation can make all the difference in the world. So I say it's never too early to start preparing for employment and working on hard skills, you know, specific type job skills like we worked on alphabetizing and sorting and some skills like that he could use on a job and copying and pasting computer stuff and, and then general skills of waiting your turn or um this, i don't know patience is a real big thing that we work on so just some of those general soft skills being on time and um getting up on time things that you can start working with your kiddos by giving them chores around the house at a level that's that works for them and then keep adding to their responsibilities and you can pay them a little bit for their little jobs and you know, that's what work is and start teaching them about what it means to work and talking about what you do for your job and what other people in the community do for their jobs. So it starts them thinking about employment as a real possibility. Um, Corinne, I'm sure you have some things to share about this as well. Yes. Yeah, so part of a support coordinator's role is to help be creative and kind of think outside of the box of how employment can be creative in their everyday schedule. And today I just had a great experience with attending a voc rehab appointment, which sorry, vocational rehabilitation is another state resource and agency that has vocational counselors available to help specifically for consumers with special needs find a job out in the community. And I had a client today talk about how she wanted to be a CNA, but we kind of talked about what the roles are as far as keeping her bedroom organized, making her bed. And so in the meeting today, we developed a goal of her going and shadowing a CNA and finding out what tasks they have to do and then having her be able to do those tasks at home. So you just kind of have to put on your creative hat and think outside of the box. Thanks, it, it is possible. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Corinne. Okay, let's talk budgets. Hey, 
your budget is determined specifically by what services you need when talking with your support coordinator or with your team. And it's important to know that your budget is based on those specific services. So it is very helpful for families to have a schedule in place of what their loved one's daily routine is like, what their hours are that they might need more supports during the summer versus less supports when they're in school. And this will really help determine the foundation of building those services to meet your family's needs. It is important to know that if there is a change, like I talked about, like a hospitalization or an illness or loss of job, that you immediately let your support coordinator know because this can affect your budget and can affect why your child might not be getting the services that they need. And then it's very important to document that, to document if they have a new medical issue come up, if there's like a new behavior concern or a new need for behavior supports. It's really important to keep your support coordinator informed. It's important to know that for SAS services, the family and the support coordinator work together to make sure that you stay on your budget and your budget is allocated for 12 months. If by chance you go over your budget, you can work with your support coordinator to ask for additional budget and additional services, but it's not always guaranteed because it's based on the service and what the family has in place in their PCSP plan. Most of the DSPD budgets are also allocated for the whole 12 months. And if you're using a provider system, your support coordinator is in charge of making sure that those services are allocated in the prescription. We call it the prescription because it's Medicaid waiver services to make sure that those are budgeted for the whole 12 months. Letters from doctors, letters from family members, or letters from from teachers, anyone that really provides support to your family in case of a change is really vital in getting that documentation for the support coordinator to request those additional funds. Just trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, yes. If by chance you don't use your allocated budget within those 12 months, it goes into the pot for other people to use. It's distributed, but DSPD will look at an average for every two to three years to see if there's any excess funds left. And that's why it's really important to document any changes that are occurring within the family, because if there's two to three years that those excess funds are not utilized, then they will go through and cut that money out. And if you are in need of that money again, your support coordinator will work with you to do what is called an RFS request. And that stands for request for additional services to get your money that your family needs during that time. And so it's really, really important. Again, I can't emphasize this enough to make sure that if you're not using any service to please let your support coordinator know. And I can speak as a self-administered services user that there were times when I couldn't find staff. 
Uh, and so I wouldn't be using my budget and I'd be in a panic that they're going to pull my budget and ding us for the next year. And when I'm saying my budget, it's my son's, but I'm, I'm coordinating it for him. Um, but they don't, they don't automatically the next year, if you don't use it, okay, well, you must not need it and cut you that amount. They do look at the total of everything that's going on. And so if you can say, oh, well, we couldn't hire any staff, um, then they will look at that and say, okay, you know, next year you should be fine with hiring that staff. Um, and I wanted to ask, and this kind of is a follow-up from a question in the chat that Bridget had about when you come into services, do they give you a budget then, or is it based on that, that first person-centered support plan? So when you first get off the waiting list, the wait list worker will do a budget. But oftentimes it's helpful to talk to your support coordinator and to review that budget and make sure that you know all of the services that are on the budget and see if that will meet your needs. Yes, it seems a little bit backwards to have them give you a budget and then say, here's what we need. But I understand that they've got to start somewhere. And so I believe if, the reason why they do that too is based on legislation and the waiting list and how many funds are allocated. And so I think that that is probably the main reason. That's right. The legislation, legislature gives so many dollars for people on the wait list to be pulled into services. And so they probably average that out over the, the number that's to be pulled into services. So if you are upset that DSPD has not been pulling people off the wait list, it is not their fault. It's the legislature's fault for not funding it. So you can always go and advocate with your legislator and let them know how long you've been on the wait list and how important this funding is to your family and that you are their constituent and you would appreciate their support. So we can hopefully get more people off the waiting list, off my soapbox. Um, okay, so we've gotten the plan written, we've got goals, we've got the provider chosen, the support coordinators, we're all working together, we're in the system. So now Corinne explain what happens going forward. So going forward, your support coordinator has a responsibility to check in with the families to say, hey, how's that summer program going for you? How's that day program going for you? And before COVID hit, <laughs> I would go out and actually visit with my consumers, with my clients at their day programs, talk with staff, make sure that everything was going okay. Right now, it's all telehealth because we're trying to keep everyone safe, but we are required to do face-to-face -face visits with all of their supports, and depending on that support will determine when we do that face-to-face -face visit. We are always checking in with families. If you're doing staff supports, we have to get your monthly summary and the progress towards your PCSP goals. And also with providers, we are doing that as well. And so that monthly summary really breaks down the progress that they have in reaching their goals, what activities they have done to help support the client with reaching that goal. And then what I really find and what I love to celebrate is when that progress is made to kind of keep a list and keep an idea of the support strategies, the coping skills, the little tools that are really helping to fill their little buckets to help them reach that progress and to reach those goals. Medicaid also wants to know why no progress was made during that month. And it's really important to list like, again, hospitalizations, illnesses, um, if a family member got really sick, it just helps to have a clear picture of what's going on with the family as well, because we know that the consumers and clients are connected with the family. And when there's 
a healthy family, then those goals are really being made and progress is happening when there's needs to support the whole family. We need to know that so that we can continue on that path to get in touch with community resources or to change services so that we know that the client is making progress. Thanks, Corinne. And from the family's perspective, we need to be sure to communicate with our support coordinator on how things are progressing and not just about how things are going on our goals and with the provider or our staff, but also talk about any major life events that are happening or changes in your um, in your life, any, um, you know, big events, and make sure that you're keeping them informed with your monthly summaries on your self-administered staff, if that's applicable, or how communication is going with your providers, if that's applicable, um, and invite your support coordinator to those important meetings that you have. They may not be able to come based on time constraints, but I know having Corinne at our side at some really big IEP meetings <laughs> that were a little dicey, um, it was nice to have her on our side of the table, so to speak, and as an advocate for our son. So um, just keep, keep the lines of communication open. You don't want to text every day with, you know, what, what has happened that day, but just make sure that you're keeping the lines of communication open so that they can be a, a meaningful member of your support team. I would say too, letting them know about major life events, even happy events too, like weddings or like if they were able to get a job or something exciting happened at school. Support coordinators love what we do and we love celebrating our clients. So I know I'm always talking about major life events, but happy ones too. They don't have to be negative. And I love it too that um, Corinne can't check in on my son during his day program via telehealth because it just messes with his mojo. And so um, I love that Corinne is able to contact the providers and have those conversations. And then I love hearing what they talk about in those little meetings because sometimes the provider will share things with Corinne about cute things that my son has done. And it, I love it. I love it. So having that, that, Good communication is fabulous to keep that team building going. So we've hit you with a fire hose of information about DSPD services and what happens when you come into services. So now's the time for you to blast us with questions that have come up as you've been listening that you haven't already asked. Yes, Scott. So um, currently we are on Medicaid, but we're not on DSPD. We're, we're in the wait list. And um, does, does it require a month or a, um, a yearly update or a review with Medicaid? Or yeah, so there are some different types of Medicaid programs. Yeah. And so with each Medicaid program, there are some review processes. Uh -huh. So I would definitely reach out to your Medicaid worker and also like the Utah Parent Center, Family to Family Network. Yeah. And okay. they have a great team that is specifically trained for Medicaid issues, and they would be a great resource to okay. help you with okay. that. So my my daughter went from 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 being eight from being 18 mm -hmm. and she's she's on adult Medicaid now and um she's 19 19 right now and and I was <clears throat> I was wondering what review process do they have you know <laughs> yeah yeah, so it's very important to make sure that you reach out. And I forgot to mention this too, but a lot of these services, um, they are required by law to send you letters and mail by oh, mail. Really? 
to make sure that you are getting that information. And so I would definitely reach out to the Utah Parent Center and just okay. ask them who their Medicaid specialist is. I know they have a whole group and yeah. they would definitely get you in okay. contact and get you support that you need so, for that. Look, currently we're not on DSPD right now. We're on the waiting list. So yeah. I didn't know and, if if it required us to every year to, to oh. check in with them or... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you need to check in with your waitlist worker every year, at least yeah. every year. Well, and then, I mean, I've 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 called them every month. Good for you. <laughs> and then, them I'm every sure month, they, and I've told them they love hearing from you. <laughs> what what's going on and and things like that, and what problems we're having, you know, her Thanks. being not being on that list. <laughs> Perfect. Are, are not being in services. So I but call it, them all the time. Even when you are in services, I, I just got my son's yearly review from Medicaid um, last week. Oh, and really? I, I'm one who procrastinates dealing with it because I don't like it, but it just asks a whole lot of questions like who lives in the household, you know, yeah. have things changed? And then they want to know what um, his assets are. And so you just have to collect that information and send it back or they've got a lovely online tool that you okay you can do it so it's not a huge deal um yeah. to do but you will do that when you're okay. in services so it they should it should be in the next couple of i'm i'm not sure her her birthday was um on november 30th <clears throat> she she turned 19 this year so um and she she's been on medicaid for one year so um, she may be due for a review but yeah. um as corinne said you can call the utah parent center and i think the okay. phone number's in the chat um and yeah. ask for yeah, utah family is. voices yeah yeah that's it utah family voices yeah and that oh. that team can they're the Medicaid gurus for the parent center, so they okay. can help you walk through that process. Okay, thank you. Thanks for being here, Scott. Um, Heather wants to know if she can get the recording from last month's class, and yes, she can. Um, I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Bridget. So we got emergency respite, and I'm looking at the paperwork. I'm just wondering, can you tell me how to figure out who the fiscal agent is? Because it's tell me use a fiscal agent, but I have no idea how to figure that out. We didn't really talk about that, but that's part of self-administered services. Corinne? Yes. And also I know, or I've heard through the grapevine that um, one-time respite is being offered to families on the waiting list. Is that right? Can someone confirm? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we're on the wait yeah. list. And we got it for oh. Yay! Oh, that's something so, to celebrate too. So Good. It, it was offered twice this year, okay. or twice, or one last once last year and once this year. Okay, awesome. So your fiscal agent services, they are contracted with DSPD to handle like your payroll, to handle your taxes, to do your W twos. And there are four contracted companies within DSPD, and I can get you the company names. I forget off the top of my head all four, but really- I've got yeah. them. Okay. They're Valentine, oh. yep. Valentine Consulting, Morningstar, Leonard Consulting, and Acumen Fiscal Agents. And so Bridget, to answer your question, you just have to choose one. <laughs> and it's kind of harder for families that are on the waiting list, but I would highly recommend just going to their website and just like reviewing them to see which you feel would best meet your family's needs. Going to these individuals wait, um, website or to the DPS? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it was Valentine, Morningstar, Leonard, and what was the last one? Acumen. Acumen. I wonder if we could put it in the chat. I see you. Yes. Yes. I need to stop sharing my screen and then I can do a whole lot of things because otherwise, apparently you were all watching me <laughs> go find information to put in the chat. I'm so sorry. Um, 
So let me just give you our contact information yeah. and then I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, so Corinne's information and my information. So if you have questions about, uh, about um, case management stuff, support coordinator stuff, then she's the gal to ask, or you're welcome to contact me at the Utah Parent Center and I can answer questions as well. Okay, so I'll leave that up for one more second. And then stop sharing. Okay, so. Sorry, can I ask a question really quick? Yeah. What was, what is the one time, sorry, what was the one time respite from the, the, for those on the waiting list? What was, what were you talking about? I missed that. Yes. So everyone who is on the waiting list, depending on the application and the services and information that you send to DSPD, they have a whole committee that reviews that information and they prioritize who is able to get one-time funding while they're waiting on the waiting list. And so not every family gets that. It's based on a certain amount of criteria that you meet. And then that is to kind of help the gap until you get full DSPD services. Okay, sorry. I, I don't know if I think it's my internet's unstable. Sorry. I'm not. Okay. Maybe it's back. Okay, I think I might know what you're talking about. Okay, I can just ask my worker. Can you can you understand me? My internet yes. decided yeah. to be weird. So do you have a wait list worker? You've been assigned a wait list worker? Yes, they I just and I emailed them yesterday and they said that they had changed me to someone else. So I need to email that person now, but I didn't know I was changed. So I guess I just need to ask. So I can do that. Yeah. But did yeah. that they re I know they did that last year at one point, but did they redo it again for this year for 2022? So I am hearing that some people are getting funded. So I would definitely reach out to your waitlist worker. Okay. We just Thank got you. ours last week. Okay, thank you. I will check. Thanks so much. Can I ask another question? Um, so on it, it's telling me the respite, emergency respite that I could only, on the self administrated I could only pay fourteen twelve an hour. There's no way I'm going to be able to get somebody to come watch this kid for fourteen twelve an hour. So what do I do? That is all that the rate limit will allow. So that is all you are able to pay from the one-time respite funds. I can tell you as a parent, what some parents have done is pay that and then supplement it with a couple of bucks an hour out of pocket, okay. which is an ideal, but- and I'd rather see that heard, find somebody. Right, if you could find somebody, I mean, there's a staffing crisis and pay is an issue and- and we're working with the legislature right now to try and get those funds. Um, and it looks like Jody is um, putting, helping me put the, the, the fiscal agents in the chat. We're kind of tag teaming each other. And then Lisa, I just saw in the chat that the fiscal agent service takes some of that money. So mm -hmm. yes, they have to take some of that money to be able to do the payroll, to be able to do the taxes, to do the W-2s. And so it's a set amount per month that DSPD has contracted with them to pay them to do that paperwork. Yeah, my, my paper says it's $95.24 a month that they take. Yes. Um, so I really need my son to be able to interact with other kids to get out of the house because he does so much better when he's with people like him. He, he enjoys it. So I'm really looking for a respite where they come and get him and take him and do stuff with him. Do you have any of these companies on this great big massive list that you suggest we live in Saratoga Springs. 
Is there any of them that speak out that you just think this is great? He's nonverbal, autistic. He has Angelman syndrome. So he's about two mentally. So you're looking at the DSPD provider list? Um, this great big email list they sent me. The, yeah, most frequently used providers and providers offering full services. Yeah. So, so anyone um, I, I, don't know, I don't know if Corinne can even tip her hand one way or another based on her support <laughs> coordinator hat. And as a parent, I can, but I'm not familiar with, um, with that area. But what I can say is find somebody who is taking clients. That's going to be the hard part for you. Yeah, that's what I'm finding is I've been calling and nobody's taking clients because yeah. they don't have the staff. Right. And that's very, very real issue. So, um, yeah, and, and maybe getting on a, a social media board and finding someone, some other families who are getting this respite and saying, let's get our, our people together at the library or, you know, finding your own ways to get them out in the community. Corinne, were you about to say something? Yeah, so are they allowed to do self-administered services with that one-time respite money? Yes. 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 Okay. So but then, also, oh, go ahead. Oh, so then this is where like the creative thinking outside of the box might come in to help you, Bridget. Okay. Maybe just like putting on like your Facebook or an Instagram post or something and seeing if there's other moms that have like a respite worker already that are willing or looking for more hours, like you just have to kind of get a fill out there to see. Okay. And um, I was just going to mention, if you get on the Eagle Mountain City Center or City, let's see, Eagle Mountain City Citizens um, and search respite, you'll find that there's quite a few people that have asked and have found people that way. Um, and also, aides at school yeah um, they don't get paid even the twelve dollars <laughs> and so sometimes they're looking for additional work as well especially in the summer yeah, and then that's also, where it started also i found like contacting uvu and BYU, they have a special education department and UVU has a social work department. And I found that like putting up want ads there, you're kind of getting the feel for people who want to be in the field. So that's like another good resource that I've kind of guided families to. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks. Are there any more questions? You've got what's left of my brain and Corinne's got an amazing brain. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, look forward to, I'm going to stop the recording.